get to the North Pole. So are you ready to go? I just yeah, it was uh it's gonna be ready to go. Okay. <laughs> uh well to make a, a long story short, uh Cook in two Inuits uh did venture for it from the northern tip of Axel Heiberg. By now we're in the spring of 1908, uh late winter spring of 1908. And they ventured across the ice, the sea ice of the Arctic. They got on the polar ice cap. And on April 21st, and uh, that is 1908, the great day finally came. According to his journal, according to what he later said, Dr. Cook and two Inuit comrades, uh, with plenty of muck socks and meat and pemmican to sustain them, actually got to the North Pole, April 21st, 1908. Uh, that's Cape Stallsworthy. Now we can go to the next slide. That's where they started out from. And uh, the next slide depicts the picture that Cook took once they got to the North Pole. It's a little bit blurry, but that's okay. The original picture was blurry too. And there you see the American flag uh, and two people standing there, a third person took the photograph. And besides Cook, the people who got to the North Pole, April 21st, 1908, uh, were the two Inuits, uh, Etu Kushuk and Afela, uh, who were accompanying him. All about him, Cook said, was desolation. <clears throat> Nothing to be seen but white all around him. Quote, we, the, we were the only pulsating creatures in a world of ice, <laughs> he wrote in his diary. But that, of course, was the problem. Uh, once you get to the North Pole, it's not that hard to know if you're at the North Pole. You just have to know how to use a sextant and a chronometer. You've got to know the time of day. You've got to do some math. And you can pretty much know you're at the North Pole or really close to it. But how would anybody else know you got to the North Pole? That's the problem. Now, he had a photograph that he took. You can see it right there. But that could have been taken anywhere in the Arctic. So how do we know that Cook actually got to the North Pole? That's going to be a controversy, as we'll see a little bit later on. What followed for Cook, however, uh, after April of 1908, when he said he and the Inuits got there, was another winter in, uh, another late spring and summer, uh, and into the winter in the Arctic. He now had to leave the North Pole. And down to the south he went with the Inuits. And because the pack ice was moving to the west, unfortunately so did Cook in the Inuits. And instead of going due south, back to Axel Heiberg and Ellesmere, uh, they went further to the west. The only benefit of that was that along the way, apparently Cook actually became the first non-Inuit to actually stand on an, a Canadian Arctic island as an American. Uh, and that island is Megan Island. Uh, we used to use the term discovery for this sort of thing. We don't do that anymore. But he was the first American non-Inuit to actually find and stand upon a Canadian island. That's Megan Island. And then on the way from there, still trying to get south and eventually to Greenland, he ended up having to spend the next winter, uh, beginning uh, in, the, in the late fall, on Devon Island, uh, far to the south of where he really wanted to be. They had to dig into a hovel, uh, and through great privations, they survived the winter. Until in 1909, uh, Cook could emerge from Devon Island and try to get to the east of Greenland, where finally he could find a way to report what he had done. Now, here's where things get a little bit complicated, uh, because Cook did get to Greenland, uh, finally, in uh, April of 1909, and uh, there he met a hunter who was inhabiting one of the cabins that uh, Cook and Bradley had built when they were on their hunting trip in 1907, and that guy's name was Whitney. And Cook got to Whitney, and he said, I got to the North Pole, I got there. Uh, we can go to the next slide now, maybe. And he said to Whitney, I've got to get the word out, I've got to get the word out. But how was he going to get the word out from Eta on the Smith Sound? There's no telegraph there, and it'd be a while before a ship was going to dock there. So what Cook had to do was go far to the south, 700 miles far to the south in Greenland, to get to the nearest place where he could get on a ship, a steamer, and get somewhere where he could send a telegraph. And according to his story, he didn't want to take all his documents with him. Uh, his logbook and all the things that he had uh, used as documents and resources to actually describe what he'd done to get to the North Pole. He had three boxes of stuff, records, and he had a sextant that he said he'd used at the North Pole. He left all that stuff with Whitney. And he said, you keep this for me, and I I'm going to travel light. I'm going to get through Grenarvik, and then I'm going to get a steamer, and I'm going to tell the world what I've done. So that's what he did. He left the stuff with Whitney, got on some skis, got some sledges, down to Upanarvik he went. He did catch a steamer finally towards the end of the summer. And then finally, on September 1st, on the way east, he was able to convince the steamer to stop in the Shetland Islands. Now it's September 1st, 1909, 
And on that date, he finally sent a telegraph to one of his patrons, uh, none other than James Gordon Bennett of the New York Herald. I've done it. I've reached the pole. And here's the headline where Dr. Cook was made famous all over the world. Uh, this is from the New York Tribune. Yeah. And uh, you'll see it's a uh, front page uh, in, in extraordinary detail with an, uh, a rendering of the photograph I showed you earlier of, of Cook at the North Pole. Cook was now the hero of the age. He got to Copenhagen, a crowd of 100,000 people welcomed him to Denmark. He got a medal from the King of Denmark. He had achieved one of the great feats of exploration of all time. And eventually he got back to Brooklyn. More crowds greeted him in his home country, his hometown of New York City. And he was so popular now in New York that a local bartender in Brooklyn created a cocktail called The Cook. And it was said that after three sips, you're at the North Pole. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was great. Cook has achieved uh, his life's ambition. But the problem was, here it's now the summer fall of 1909. The problem was nobody has ever seen those boxes. The records in the sextant that, according to Cook, would verify that he got to the North Pole. Why hasn't anybody ever seen the boxes, the records that would actually document what Cook said he had done? And the reason is interesting, because after Cook left the documents with Whitney, way up there in northern Greenland by Smith Sound, who should happen by but a man who had power over who got on or off the ship? The man was the commander of the expedition that the ship was a part of, the Roosevelt. And that man, you won't be surprised to learn, was none other than Robin, Robert Edwin Peary. <laughs> now we go to the next slide. Uh, for the moment, as you can see here, Cook was the hero of the hour. Uh, but if anybody was going to have anything to say about that, it was Peary. And what Peary told Whitney, having found out that Cook's records were with Whitney, was that you got a choice. Either you can come home with me and leave the records in Greenland, or you can stay with the records and stay where you are in Greenland. And Whitney decided to get on the trip with Peary, who by this time allegedly was coming home from the North Pole. And the consequence was the records were put under a bunch of rocks at Eta in Greenland, and nobody has ever found them. Nobody has ever seen them again. And if that's not complicated enough, here's where things get a little bit more complicated. Peary met Whitney, as I said, in Greenland on the way back from what Peary said was a trip to the North Pole. But he'd originally stopped in Greenland in the summer of 1908 on his way to the North Pole. Uh, and at that point in Greenland, Peary had met a man who had been with Cook and had turned back from Ellesmere Island rather than accompanying him to the North Pole. And that guy's name was Franca. And Franca appeared disheveled, uh, tired, hungry, famished. But he lived enough, he was okay enough and healthy enough to tell Peary that Cook had embarked, <clears throat> that Cook was on his way to Ellesmere trying to get to the pole. And at this point, Peary now knew that Cook could have gotten there beforehand, but of course, how could he know? All Peary knew was that Cook was going to try and was trying as of 1908. Having met Franca, Peary now appropriated all the fur that Cook had acquired from the hunting expedition back in 1907 into 1908. Thousands of dollars of worth of Arctic fox fur was essentially stolen by Peary out of this resentment he felt against Cook. And in addition to that, were a number of extremely valuable narwhal tusks that were effectively Cook's property that now Peary decided to take along with him in store on the Roosevelt. And to add insult to injury, uh, Peary also told Franca, you, you can come home with the vessel that's now about to go back to New York while I stay, while I stay here in the Arctic. This is still 1908. But Peary had the temerity, after stealing all this fur, to charge John Bradley $100 to take Franco back oh, to New York Park. That's the kind of guy he was. He is often called the most unpleasant man in the history of polar exploration. <laughs> but what made it worse was that Peary, by the time he got to Greenland, and now it's 1908, uh, thinking about trying to get to the pole uh, the next spring, by the time he got to Greenland, there was another reason why a lot of people held him in disregard. Another reason why Peary was thought to be rather unpopular. And the reason was, uh, over 10 years earlier, in 1897, Peary, under instructions from the Museum of Natural History in New York, had brought back six Inuits from Greenland to New York City. 
So he sailed into New York Harbor, I think it was on the Roosevelt. And once he got there, 1897, he actually charged people 25 cents a piece to board the Washington in the Brooklyn Naval Yard, I think, to actually look at the Inuits. And even though it was summer, he made them dress in their fur uh, and kind of roast on board the ship while they were doing it. And then to make matters worse, uh, Peary delivered the Inuits to the Museum of Natural History, uh, disclaimed all further responsibility for them, and the Inuits were kept in an overheated basement at the Museum of Natural History for the next month. And if you wanted to see them and gawk at them, what you could do is visit the Museum of Natural History, and you could look at a grating in the floor down to the basement and you could look at them if you wanted to. To make matters even worse, the Inuits promptly got sick. Uh, they weren't accustomed to, of course, the diseases that New York City was famous for. Four of them quickly died of tuberculosis. One of them did go back to Greenland, uh, but four of them died in short order, uh, leaving only one more in the United States. And that's the next slide, I believe. We can go to the next slide now. That's by eight in Greenland. Uh, an Inuit shot. Uh, Charles' real name, I think, was Mene. Uh, often you, you read the child's name as Minnick. Uh, Minnick was very young when they arrived in New York. And one of the Inuits who died of tuberculosis was Minnick's father, Kisik. Of course, Minnick, suffering terrible heartache, wanted to make sure that his father was given a decent burial according to the customs of his people. But the Museum of Natural History didn't want that to happen. Instead, they lied to Minnick. They got a big log, they covered it with fur, and they pretended to bury it in the courtyard of the Museum of Natural History, when in fact what they did was they dissected his father, and they took his bones and they put it in a, a case where researchers could look at it through the glass whenever they wanted to. And poor many never found out about that for another 10 years, what had happened to his father. He eventually did get back to Greenland, but only for a while. What everybody knew as of 1908 was that Peary would not take Minnick back to Greenland on his expedition to the Arctic. And that's one reason Peary was beginning to be more and more unpopular. And he felt that if he didn't get to the pole, if he wasn't the first one there, maybe his reputation would never recover from incidents like this uh, that were crowding his past. So we take up the story again, uh, 1908, when Peary has gone to Greenland, knowing only by that point that Cook was somewhere in Ellesmere, maybe beyond it, trying himself to get to the North Pole. Peary had a very different idea about how to get there. So what he was going to do was winter uh, or spend the, the summer to the early fall in Greenland. And then he was going to go during the winter to Ellesmere. If you go to the next slide, it is from Ellesmere that he was going to get to a place called Cape Columbia on the very northern tip of Ellesmere. And in February, when the light began to appear once more, and the sun went up, never to set again until September, from there, he was trying, going to try to get to the pole by going due north from Cape Columbia, which you can see there, with uh, several different parties of Americans and Inuits to support what would eventually be a lead party that itself would try to get to the pole with a, a limited number of people. So the idea was to go in stages, to go in relays. And this became known as the Peary Way. You'd have seven different parties of Americans and Inuits and they'd each go a little bit, little bit, little bit. They'd stop, somebody else would overtake them and keep going, and keep going. And they'd have caches of supplies along the way, they'd go in relays, and systematically, even if relatively slowly, eventually there'd be a lead party, which somewhere around maybe 86 or 87 degrees north would go alone and get to the North Pole with just a few Americans and Inuits. So that was the idea. And so they got to this place, Cape Columbia. Now we go to the next slide. And it was there that a much larger expedition than Cook's, that is Peary's expedition, now began this relay idea to try to get to the North Pole that way. So there's Cape Columbia, uh, as you can see, you're on the tip of Ellesmere. The idea was to go straight north with these seven different support parties, meeting according to a staggered schedule. They would eventually go north right along 70 degrees meridian, 70 degrees longitude. And the reason they wanted to do it that way was, first of all, it goes right by Cape Columbia, 70 degrees meridian, straight north to the North Pole. And the other reason, sentimentally, was that 70 degrees meridian also passed through Eagle Island and Casco Bay, which is Peary's home. 
So that's why he wanted to choose 70 degrees for him it was going to be good luck. And as they began, all went fairly well. You go to the next slide. Right? Uh, they went over uh, sea ice that was reasonably solid. They made okay time. Uh, five parties went forward, and they eventually got to a point where two of the parties were sent back by Peary to Cape Columbia to get more fuel. But no sooner had that happened than five parties, the remaining five, were stopped with something like this right in front of them. And that's water that hasn't frozen yet. That was known as the big lead. Now, leading up to that, there were ice ridges. There were places where the crevasses were, were, were pretty deep. They got around them. They were doing OK. But this was a barrier that was much worse. How could they get across that? All they had were sledges. Peary had no choice. He had to stay right there at the big lead, hoping against hope that the ice would soon form, it would close, and they could keep going. So five parties waited in agony for six full days. Peary never knew at any point whether perhaps the lead would get bigger. Maybe it would never freeze over again. After all, it's now getting to be late February and March. Uh, could he get there at all? For him, it was the worst part of the expedition, the suspense of waiting and waiting at the big lead uh, among the five parties who were there. And luckily for them, if we go to the next slide, among the Americans with the Inuits in Peary and Matthew Henson was this man here, really famous polar explorer named Don McMillan. Uh, and this would be his very first expedition to the Arctic. He would eventually be Admiral Don McMillan, but he would go on to make 30 expeditions to the, the far north himself later on. And McMillan was a born Arctic explorer, and while everybody was patiently awaiting the big lead to close so they could get going again, it was McMillan who passed the time cracking jokes, keeping up morale, organizing sports on the ice, and most famously, even though it was 60 degrees below zero, McMillan actually was able to organize a really, really good and competitive tug-of-war competition that kept the men happy and laughing, even as Peary was steaming and fuming. Uh, sitting on a sledge, hoping the lead would finally close. And then, finally, it got to be March 11th, and looked as if the lead had closed just enough, just enough ice now, to keep going towards the North Pole. Uh, the two parties that went to the fuel dump back at Cape Columbia were not back yet, but Peary felt he had no choice. We've got to get going while we can. So he left a note for the two parties back at Cape Columbia, when and if they should go and find a way to join them, that read as follows, can wait no longer. We are short of fuel. Push on with all possible speed to overtake us. Do not camp here. Cross the lead at all costs. Because everybody else needed the fuel that those two relief parties had gone back to get. They needed fuel for cooking. They needed fuel to melt the snow. That was going to be their drinking water. It was a gamble to keep going without those two parties, but Peary gambled and they kept going. And once they got beyond the big lead, now they began to make better time. About 12 miles a day would be the average pace of one of the parties, one of the support parties, as they kept going in relay staggered intervals across the ice. Finally, the other two parties did make it, they did get across the lead, and that meant that everybody had enough fuel, at least for the time being. Now we go to the next one. The closer they got to the pole, the more valuable Matthew Henson became. Here's Henson. Uh, other than the Inuits, nobody handled sledges and dogs as well as Henson did. He was a real expert at it. And on March 14th, Peary chose Henson to lead the advance party, the latest advance party, to find a good way forward with the ridges and the crevasses on the way to the pole. On he went. The wind blowing in his face, temperatures plunging. He was able to find a good way forward at the cost of two heavily damaged sledges. They could keep going, in other words. The only member of the party who was heartbroken at this point, as things began to look more promising, was Don McMillan. He had a badly frostbitten right heel. There was no way he could walk. So he had to go back with one of the support parties uh, to Cape Columbia, and he would not get to the pole, not on this trip. But for the rest, the progress continued. Peary's idea, keep going with staggered relayed marches, maybe 12 miles at a time. An advanced party would get to a place, they'd build igloos, 
Another party comes up, they can stay in those igloos. Maybe the advanced party keeps going. Maybe they wait for somebody else, but they keep staggering to keep going in relays. Nobody gets too tired. And at 12 miles a day, for most of those parties, closer and closer to the pole, they got. And then it got to the point where Peary began sending more parties back. When the time came to actually get to the North Pole, he didn't want to go with more than maybe four or five other people. He wanted it to be small. It made sense to send parties back to Cape Columbia because by then men were getting tired, dogs were getting tired, sledges were running out. Send the uh, tired, exhausted members of the party back. Send the sledges back if they weren't much good. And all of them go to the pole with uh, the best resources in the best venue hut with you. That was the idea. The last 150 to 200 miles would be one party and one party only. And the only thing everybody knew was that Peary would be on that part. Who else? We don't know. On March 26th, a group of support parties passed 86 degrees north. Peary hadn't sent everybody back yet. There's still a lot with him. 86 degrees north. At that point, Peary sent one of the parties back to Ellesmere, back to Cape Columbia, led by a guy named Ross Marvin. And these were Peary's last words to Ross Marvin. Be careful of the leads, my boy. At least that's what he said he said. Ross Marvin went back with a couple of Inuits. As fate would have it, Ross Marvin plunged into a watery lead to his death, never came back up. There's a persistent story that Ross Marvin was so irrational and so cruel as he often was to the Inuits that maybe one of the Inuits had actually killed him on the way back. But we'll never know. Uh, all we know is that Ross Marvin was never seen again. A similar fate nearly befell one of the parties that for the time being at least was still going on with Peary and Henson and the rest of them. On the night of March 28th, the advance party that day was led by a guy named Bob Bartlett, who was turning into a pretty good polar explorer, young guy. And they were trying to get some sleep in the igloo. Usually there'd be three guys in the igloo. And when they got to the igloo after a long march, 12, 15 miles, usually the first thing they would do is brew some tea and maybe try to get some sleep until the next party came up. And this particular night, Bartlett, March 28th, and his comrades were falling asleep, here, just sleeping in the igloo. When all of a sudden, a lead opened up without warning. And the igloo turned into an island, now floating in the lead. They only had a few moments. They could have plunged to their deaths. But luckily, a big ice flow happened by just as they figured out that they were now an island in the lead. And Bartlett and the Inuits jumped on the flow, were able to get to safety, avoiding uh, a very bad way to go, alone in the army. By now, the wind was blowing even harder in their faces. The ice was becoming more jagged to the misery of men and dogs, the closer they got to the pole. And then, past 87 degrees north, there came the day when Peary finally sent everybody else back. It's just going to be him and one party, and they're going to get to the North Pole. The last of the parties, Peary, Henson, four Inuits, and they had 150 more miles to go to the pole. Five sledges, 40 very hardy dogs. At that point, we had one more stretch to go for Peary. Cook, Dr. Cook, was still laboring to try to get back to Greenland from uh, Devon Island, uh, very, very far to the south. Now, here's where the controversy begins. This Henson, of course. We go to the next slide. This is more or less the way the landscape would have looked. Peary, I think, had really good reason to choose Henson to go with him to the pole. Henson, as I said before, was a master at the sledges, very good with the dogs, and he also spoke fluent Inuit. He spoke Inuit way better than, than, than Peary did. So he's a very useful man to have along. But the thing is that once you got to the pole, as I said before, the only way you know you were there was to take a sextant reading and use your chronometer and do the math, and then you could have a proper accurate reading and then go back and tell people about it. But if it's only one person using the sextant, which is what happened with Dr. Cook, why would anybody believe you? Maybe the thing to do would be to take somebody with you to the pole who also knew how to use a sextant. And Matthew Henson, for all his other virtues, had never been trained 
on the sextant. The person who knew about sextants was really good with sextants was Bartlett, and Bartlett had been sent back. Why send Bartlett back? Why wouldn't you take somebody else with you? Because you have two people making sextant readings, then you might be all the more sure you're there. People might trust you more because it's not just you saying, I took the sextant reading, somebody else has taken the sextant reading. You compare notes, that would have been pretty good proof that they got to the North Pole. But Peary did not take Bartlett with him. Peary took Henson with him. And that's caused suspicions among some people uh, ever since 1909. So why take Henson? I've already told you there are really good reasons for taking him. But here's what Peary also said. And here's why I don't care about mispronouncing his name that much. Uh, here's what Peary said. Uh, Henson is perfectly fine. Henson is effective as long as he's with me. But he didn't want to send Henson back meeting his own party because this is what Peary said. Uh, Henson has not the racial inheritance, the daring and initiative of my Anglo-Saxon friend. Because uh, Henson was an African American. That's the way Peary felt about it. Well, whatever the complexity of Peary's thinking about all this might have been, uh, we know that as they began to approach the pole, based upon his later account, he was thinking more and more about fame and fortune and all the accolades that would be his once he got to the pole, believing still that he surely would be the first one to do it. As they approached the pole, we know from his logbook. Uh, he was making careful notes. How much money am I going to make from this? A lot of these details, by the way, are in a fine book by Edward J. Larson uh, called To the Edges of the Earth, To the Edges of the Earth. And we know uh, from Peary's account, he was noting the fact that the great Fridtjof Nansen, who we talked about during our second presentation, had gotten $50,000 for his book about crossing Greenland. So Peary figured, I should get 100000 if I get to the pole, never mind 50,000. He even planned out a grand mausoleum that would eventually hold his remains, complete with a statue of Peary right on top for all the world to see. He's actually designing it in his little logbook. And here they are approaching the pole. Meanwhile, according to his journal, by this point, after Bartlett had gone back with the last of the support parties, at this point, they were making unbelievable progress. Not 12 miles a day. That's what they've been doing before this. Now they're making 25 miles a day, sometimes 30 miles a day. And then it got to be April 6th. On the morning of April 6th, by this point, of course, uh, the, the sun's up all the time and had been true for several weeks. By April 6th, that morning, they covered 30 miles. And Henson thought, we've done it. We've gotten to the pole, which would have made him the first one to be there. But Peary said, no, not quite. And it got to be the afternoon and the evening of April 6th, still light, of course. Peary insisted on going a bit further. They actually went another 10 miles that same day. They bypassed what Peary thought had to be the pole. Of course, we're there by now. Then they backtracked. And we go to the next slide. It was at this point, as you can see, the North Pole, 90 degrees north. Go to the next slide that Peary took, uh, or maybe it was Henson, uh, the famous picture. Everybody is now at what I say is the North Pole. So it's Henson who got there, it's Peary who got there, and then the four Inuits who were with them, uh, Butag, Ukujak, Ikiniakwag, and Sigluk. All of them got to the North Pole. The pole at last, wrote Peary in his journal. He had made it to the very top of the globe after remarkable shifts of distance, 25, 30 miles a day, unbelievable. But did he get there? Many observers doubt, mainly because the kind of progress he was making was astounding. 25 miles a day in the, in the Arctic, right by the North Pole. Uh, now, he always said the ice was smoother at the pole uh, once they got closer and closer to it. And some experience bears that out. But that's still a lot of miles every day to get there when he said he did on April 6th. But the main reason people are skeptical, remember, is that Peary had said, we're going to go right up. The 70th meridian. We're going to go in a straight line, get to the North Pole, and if you're going 25 miles a day in a straight line, you get there reasonably well, at least if the ice is smooth. But how did he know he was going in a straight line? Peary himself admitted he never took a chronometer read. He had no idea what his actual longitude actually was. He thought he was going straight, but of course he couldn't have been going straight. It had to be zigzagging because the ice moves, for one thing. 
So with all this zigzagging that he probably had to do, this is why a lot of people doubt his account. Most authorities believe he could not have gotten there on April 6th. It's very unlikely. Possible, but unlikely. On April 7th, uh, Peary claimed he took 13 separate sextant readings that proved he was at the North Pole. And only then did he start back. But there remains a great deal of scientific uh, doubt about whether he actually got there. Uh, some believe that he might have gotten within 30 miles. Not bad in itself. Uh, but probably today, the weight of opinion is that probably didn't quite get to the North Pole. Uh, just there's too much indirection that was inevitable. And because he didn't take chronometer readings, then we have no reason to believe he ever was actually on that straight line that he insisted he was. Nevertheless, he's going to claim he went to the North Pole. This is the way he described it. North and South and East and West come together all at once. Thrilling moment, as he described it later. But in the last analysis, we only have Peary's word for it, uh, just as we really only have uh, Cook's word for it, Peary and Henson uh, and Cook's word for it, uh, in, in the Inuits, very few of whom were interviewed afterwards about all this. Uh, that flag, by the way, if you see in the picture, that flag was sewn by Josephine. Uh, remember Josephine Peary, uh, his indefatigable wife. Could have been taken anywhere, so we're left with a mystery. Uh, did either one of them get there? All we know is that finally, uh, Peary did get back to Smith Sound. Now it's uh, late summer, 1909. That's when he heard that uh, Whitney had these records that Cook had left. That's when he heard that Cook thing moved in there. So as fast as he could on the Roosevelt, he kept going south uh, down the, the Baffin Strait, Nary Sound, the Baffin Strait. And he got to eventually Labrador, and it was from Labrador that he sent his own telegram saying that he had gone to the North Pole and he was the first one. So Cook sent the telegram from the Shetland Islands September 1st. Peary sent his telegram on September 5th, only four days later. Now we go to the next slide, and that means we've got a conflict. Who got to the North Pole first? Uh, now, so there's two trivia questions today. Uh, first trivia question is what is wrong with this picture? Uh, there's a Cook on the right, Peary on the left. Fighting over the honor of who got to the North Pole first. Penguins. Penguins, yes, very good. There were no penguins on the North Pole. <laughs> uh, things would have been a lot different. Uh, they wouldn't have had to subsist on pemmican. Uh, walrus, pemmican, beef, pemmican, all manner of pemmican. Uh, and penguins were there, uh, but they weren't there. And so the point is moved. Well, who to believe, uh, Cook or Peary or neither? If you go to the next slide. Uh, for the time being, and for many years thereafter, Peary was the one who enjoyed the honor. And the reason was not long after the controversy erupted, and it was a front page controversy for months, word arrived that in all likelihood, Cook had lied about getting to the top of Mount McKinley. Remember, we talked about that last time, Denali, Mount McKinley. And because Cook apparently had not told the truth about that, his word about getting to the pole could not be trusted either. And eventually, Peary was given the honor by Congress, and by the National Geographic Society, very important, uh, probably been the first one to get to the North Pole, even though no third party independent observer would look at his records until the 1980s. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Peary was the man of the hour. He went on a speaking tour, raised a bunch of money, made some cash. Here he is at Symphony Hall in Boston, about to give a lecture. Not long after he got back, it's February of 1910. He was now the man of the hour. Uh, but who would believe? Uh, well, again, uh, to this day, we don't know. They both might have made it. Uh, one of them might have made it, the other one might not have. But I would say the weight of opinion is probably neither one got there, uh, neither Cook nor Peary. Those who have looked at this question in great detail would usually say that. We all agree there's no way to know. Probably neither of them got there. So here we are. We only got like, like 10 minutes left in our lecture series this winter, this uh, spring. And Apparently, it was all for naught, uh, because we don't know who got to the North Pole. Yes, we do. <laughs> we do know who definitely got to the North Pole first. And now we turn back to our friend, Ronald Amundsen. So as he was sitting there, listening to all these hardships, the big lead and jagged ice, cold condition was 60 below zero uh, during much of Peary's course to the North Pole, very cold. You might have been saying to yourself, why bother going there overland over sea ice when you don't know when it's going to be a big lead in front of you uh, like the next day? 
Why not do the easy thing? Why not take an airplane to the North Pole? Uh, well, that would have been hard to do in 1909. But Amundsen, always a very practical man, began to think seriously about that idea. Why are we bothering with all these hardships across the ice? Why not take a plane? That's the way Amundsen was. We saw this with the Yoa expedition in the Northwest Passage last time. He was a supremely practical guy. He didn't care about, oh, I've got to smuggle these hardships. Uh, I've got to be a hero. If he had a goal in mind, he wanted to do it the easiest, the most practical way. That, that was just Amundsen. So why not fly to the North Pole? So in 1913, he actually learned to fly because he thought that would be the way to go. And he began to look into the possibility of leasing airplanes to fly to the pole. But every time somebody would test out an airplane that Amundsen wanted to lease, it would crash. And I think at least once Amundsen was on a plane that crashed. But he wouldn't give up. And so finally, in 1925, he... Hmm? Oh, 12, 12 years later. Yeah, that's right. Uh, he, he, he finally decided to give it a try. So now we go to the next slide. And uh, this is one of the most remarkable stories of all. Uh, Amundsen managed to find a, a really experienced flyer, brilliant flyer, uh, named Jalmar Riesler Larsen. And along with uh, Jalmar Riesler Larsen and I think four other men, the idea was to take two seaplanes. And uh, that's one of them, the N24. The other one was N25. And the idea was to take off from Spitsbergen north of Norway, and eventually use the planes to get to the North Pole, maybe to land at the North Pole. So that's what they decided to do. Uh, so they all take off two seaplanes from Spitsbergen, and everything's fine for a while, and they got to 87 degrees 45, as we now know. And Amazon thought it might be a good idea to take some readings. So it's hard to do from the air. Maybe we should touch down for the time being. They didn't have all the gas in the world, but they wanted to know exactly where they were. Uh, so they decided to land. And on the landing, uh, that plane, the N24, suffered bad damage, meaning there's only one plane left, the N25. So they all went to the N25, but in the meantime, the ice had shifted a bit in front of them, and that didn't seem to be a good way to take off again. They've got to make their own airstrip. So here's what happened. For 26 days, six men lived in that seaplane. And the whole time, they're trying to smooth out an airstrip in front of them so they can take off again. And every time they get something pretty much smoothed out, the ice moves. For 26 days, as frustrating as you can imagine, uh, Amundsen never quite gave up hope, but it was looking more and more hopeless until finally they were able to pack in enough snow right in front of them to have some chance of taking off. And this is one of the great moments of polar exploration. Uh, Jean-Marc Ries Rieser Larson somehow got enough speed, it's got an overloaded seaplane, supplies and six men on it, all crammed in. Next time you hear complaining thing about uh, American Airlines, there's no room. Think about these guys, yeah. six people on the seaplane, uh, and they just got up, they just took up. But by now, they, they, they don't have the, the gas in the provisions needed to, to get to the North Pole. They had to turn around. At this point, if I'd been Amundsen, you go to the next slide. At this point, with planes crash landing, and 26 days in the Arctic, with no hope of rescue, by the way, they all would have died there and been able to take off. I might have said to myself, in regard to this plan about flying to the North Pole, maybe the universe is trying to tell me something. Maybe we shouldn't do this, but that was an ominous. Now we go to the next slide. He had another idea, and uh, this would be in 1926. <laughs> Why bother with a seaplane, gasoline powered uh, airplane, fixed wing, Let's take a dirigible. Let's take an airship. And so what he did was he got an American, a guy named Lincoln Ellsworth, to put up the money. And they bought a big airship from the Italian government, and they renamed it the Norga, after Norway. The designer of that airship, the famous uh, Umberto Nobile, would be along with him on this trip. Ellsworth, Nobile, Amundsen, 13 other men. So there's 16 people in that gondola, as you can uh, just barely see under the uh, Norga. And they took off from Spitsbergen again. Now it's uh, uh, May of 1926. Is that hydrogen or helium? I think hydrogen. So they, they take off in this thing. Now this was the way to go to the North Pole because that gondola was really comfortable. Posh armchairs, they're just sitting there in the gondola. The Norga takes off, 
very smooth flight, almost just looking down, nothing but white, nothing but white, no details at all. Uh, but they had uh, accurate ways to tell where they were. And just within a few hours, they passed right over the North Pole. The whole expedition would take three days. And during the last part of it, they were about to land in Alaska. And Amundsen could look down from the Norga and he could see the old hut he had built the winter after they got through the Northwest Passage to spend the winter before telling the world what they had done all the way back in 1905. But here we are 20 years later, and this absolutely positively is the event that marks the first visit to the North Pole by human beings. It was the flight of the Norga led by Amundsen and Nobile over the North Pole. However, they never landed. They never landed. Which brings up another story. I said we have two great moments of polar exploration to go. One great moment of polar exploration was the improbable takeoff uh, by the N25 on the ice, uh, two degrees latitude from the North Pole. A great polar moment of exploration, which is, doesn't make sense, great moment of polar exploration number two happened much later. You go to the next slide. Um, one night, one night in the 60s, a bunch of guys were hanging out at the Pickwick Bar, famous bar in Duluth, Minnesota. I think it was originally there in 1914. So they're hanging out at the Pickwick, and they began to say, one of my snowmobiles, why, why doesn't somebody take a snowmobile to the North Pole? Couldn't you take a snowmobile to the North Pole? Uh, and it occurred to a guy named Ralph Playstead. Next slide. This guy, yeah. You can take a snowmobile to the North Pole. And in April of 1968, he went to the North Pole, and he's the first person to set foot at the North Pole. Uh, the Minnesotan, Ralph Placeket from Bruno, Minnesota, he got to the North Pole uh, in April of 1968. Uh, all because a bunch of guys were having beer at the Pickwick one night, and they came up with this idea. And, and that's what he did on that ski do there. You go to the next slide, uh, he's, uh, he's famous in Minnesota, he's got this nice plaque. Uh, first, it's hard to officially reach the North Pole by snowmobile. I apologize for the split infinitive, uh, but that, that is, in fact, the first guy to get there. So, Amazon and his expedition were the first ones to see the North Pole, first ones actually get there. They could see below them uh, a bunch of ice. And he uh, placed was the first one actually set foot there. And the next year, uh, an Englishman named Wally Herbert became the first person to get there by dog sled, which, of course, is how Peary and Cook had tried to go. And that almost brings us to the end of our presentation, just some an epilogue. Uh, the reason to doubt Peary, especially, was very strong as of the 1980s. And that's when third parties began looking at the records and concluding that probably haven't gotten there. The jury is still out, uh, but, but I guess we'll never know for sure. But when Peary died in 1920, as he did, he was re usually recognized as the man who had gotten there first. Matthew Henson lived for 35 more years mostly working at the U.S. Custom House in New York City. Both Peary and Henson were the fathers of Inuit children, uh, and their descendants are in Greenland to this day, uh, a long series of descendants. And uh, appropriately, Peary and Henson uh, lay very close to each other today in Arlington National Cemetery. You can see their graves uh, whenever you want. That leaves one more moment. Uh, I think it happened just after the Norga expedition. Now, remember, uh, Cook was not widely thought of, not widely uh, admired after the Denali hoax was revealed. Uh, and his story is very sad. Uh, what happened to him was that after World War I, he needed a way to make some money. So what he did was he got himself involved in a company called Revere Oil Company. And the idea was Revere, this was the early 1920s, would buy up the stock from companies that had been looking for oil wells that never found anything and we're about to go belly up. So thousands of investors had bought stock in the teens and the early 20s in uh, wildcat oil exploration companies. And they didn't make any money because a lot of oil wasn't found. So Cook's idea was, uh, you people with stock that now is worthless in these other companies, you bring the stock to Revere. And in exchange, I will give you Revere stock. And now you're gonna be stockholders of my new company. We're gonna go find oil, we're all gonna get rich. And in the meantime, you have to give me a premium for the privilege of converting your stock into my stock. So what he was doing was taking these premium payments and over time, giving them back little by little in the form of dividends. But they really weren't dividends because they weren't really exploring for oil. It was like a Ponzi scheme. 
And eventually people caught up with him and he was charged with fraud and he was sentenced to 14 years in jail at uh, Fort Leavenworth. That's Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. The tragic irony is that after he went to jail, uh, that Revere company actually did find a place for him, but uh, uh -huh. not in time to save him. But he soon became the most popular prisoner there because he worked as the doctor, treated prisoners very well, had an affable good humor about him, as he always did. But uh, the last moment that I wanted to mention, oh, by the way, his fellow prisoner, this is the last trivia question, uh, his fellow prisoner at Leatherworth was a guy named Robert Stroud. What else is Robert Stroud known as? Bird Man and Dr. Stroud. That's right. Mm. Well, anyway, uh, Revere had bought up these 250 companies uh, for the time being, he looked like a fraud. Uh, so there he is in Fort Leatherworth. And who should visit him one day than his old friend, Raoul Amundsen? Mm -hmm. And uh, Amundsen was told, don't go to see Cook. He's a fraud. You'll look bad if you go see Cook. Amundsen was one of the most famous men in the world. Uh, but he took a detour from an American tour. He made a special trip just to see his old friend. Uh, because what they knew was that the two of them had shared something nobody else could ever share. Uh, they were part of the Belgica. Uh, they'd been in that great expedition in 1897, 1898. Cook and Amundsen had saved every man on that expedition because of their heroism, their energy, their knowledge, their spirit of experimentation, their good humor. They remembered that, and in the spirit of their old comradeship, the old polar explorers had a, an afternoon sharing memories at Leavenworth. And then it was time for Amundsen to leave, and the two never saw each other again, because Amundsen would have lived much longer than that. And uh, therein lies another story, uh, but we'll have to get to that next year. So <laughs> we'll uh, stop there. Uh, and if uh, anybody has any questions, you can uh, go ahead and ask now. I would think that uh, I think you said Terry took 30 uh, celestial readings uh, mm -hmm. allegedly to identify where he was. Wouldn't there have been an adequate record? Yeah. That? Uh, uh, so, and the other aspect of that is. The chronometer is especially important. Yeah. And if you're a second off, as I recall, you're a mile off. And if he was holding that sextant, traveling with it for months, not years, the sextant of the uh, chronometer could have been three minutes off and it could be 60 miles away from the North Pole. Uh, yeah, that, that's probably the leading element in the indictment against Peary that he wasn't taking these chronometer readings. Now, as far as the sextant is concerned, the, the records are there. The uh, third parties who've examined the sextant records yeah. believe there's a strong possibility that they were doctored mm -hmm. somehow by Peary. That's something else that could ever be proven. But they tried to match up the sextant readings, the probable time of day, with what the shadows would have been at that point, at that time, at that yeah. day. And they don't correlate all that well. It's not, it's not a complete mismatch, yeah. but there's still a lot of reason to doubt. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say that somebody did try to replicate Peary's trip uh, that rapid speed along the ice, and they actually were able to do it. And they actually were going really, really fast because the, the ice there at the North Pole tends to be smoother, but that still leaves the problem about was he zigging and zagging because we don't know if he could have been going in a straight line. But they, that's probably the leading reason to doubt it. We have a question from our Zoom. Uh, okay. What finally happened to Minnook? Oh, what finally happened to him was that he got to Greenland uh, on the relief vessel that went to pick up Peary. So uh, Peary would have taken him to Greenland, but another vessel that went to pick Peary up did take Minnick. That was in 1909. And they dropped him off in Greenland. And by now, I think he, would, he was in his teens, maybe a little bit older than that. But he really couldn't make a go of it in Greenland because uh, he no longer could speak Inuit very well. And he had lost a lot of the skills that the Inuits typically have. He found he was not happy there. And so he came yeah. back. To the United States. And he achieved a certain measure of happiness. He was working at a job that he liked when he was in his 20s as a lumberjack in the woods of New Hampshire. He was doing okay there. He had friends. He might have made a life for himself. But before he could, uh, he died of the flu. He died in the flu epidemic. Uh, and so he, he died young. And uh, his remains are back in Greenland. Eventually, the Museum of Natural History did give up the remains of Kisik and the other Inuits. And they were reburied in Greenland, but it took until 1993 for them to do that. Go ahead, yes. If you talked about Perry um, writing down all the money that he would make. Yeah. Did he really get rich? Because you know, that symphony hall in 1910, if the tickets were $1, $2, and 3, which seemed high for that time. Yeah, you know, he was the man of the hour. 
and how many times did you get to see the guy who conquered the North Pole? Yeah. He, he, he made a good bit of money. He was very well financed by a number of people like this banker, Morris Jessup, who put up all the money he needed for the expedition. So he didn't have to go into debt on the expeditions. And he reaped the benefits of speaking fees, uh, books that he wrote afterwards. So he, he did quite well for himself. His home is preserved on Eagle Island. I think you can still go see it. And he's got a museum, the uh, uh, Peary McMillan Museum at Bowdoin, that uh, has a lot of his artifacts. Uh, but he, he, he made enough money uh, so that he was, his family was okay after he died, and he did fine. But he never built that mausoleum? Um, uh, no, the mausoleum was never built. So it's kind of a, a nice monument at Arlington. I think it's, it's a big sphere, and those of you who have seen it, because he conquered the northern part of the sphere. Uh -huh. But uh, no mausoleum, that never happened. I don't know what his book advanced. I don't know if he got $100,000 for the book, but, uh, but he did okay. Was he not an uh, admiral of the U.S. Navy? Uh, I think he, he was made an honorary, honorary. honorary admiral. Uh, he, he had gotten, it's funny because he got a late start in the Navy. Uh, he was one of the oldest ensigns, ensigns in the Navy's history. Uh, I think he, he was an ensign when he was in his late 20s, early 30s. Uh, but he, he never rose up the ranks the way most officers do because he kept doing these leaves of absence. He was always on absence and leave of absence from the Navy. And I, I, if he was an admiral, I think it might have been an honorary. The Roosevelt that he took north mm -hmm. was a U.S. Navy ship. Yeah. Okay. Your Navy, uh, it would seem like he was almost employed or still in the Navy, and the Navy mm -hmm. should have regulated some of the things he was doing. Well, I think he was officially commander, which is pretty close to that man, yeah. on his own, yeah. uh, at the time that he retired from his exploration, because he didn't live much longer. He lived another decade after he got back from the North Pole. I think he was commander in the usual promotions and maybe an honorary admiral, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. Mm. Uh, I know that during World War One, he did more service to his country by pioneering probable airmail routes, I believe is what he did. Uh, but I don't think he had any, any other active role in the war. Go ahead, yes. Have there been many other people now in the uh, interim who have gone to the North Pole? Yeah, pretty fair amount. Uh, there's a research station up there. I bet that it's not manned all year round, but, but people who want to go there can, they can fly there. Uh, a lot of people have been under the North Pole. Uh, Some can do that. Yeah. Uh, so this has been more heavily visited ever since the, the late 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. How did they manage to carry that huge American flag system? Oh, they, they had it all packed in the sledge. It's not, I'm not saying research station, by the way. Remember the ice moves? Mm -hmm. So the, the states, they keep on to set it back up. But, but they have facilities that they, they try to maintain as best they can. Mm -hmm. But they, they can pack the sledge in those, uh, the flag in those sledges. You can pack a lot of stuff in sledges, mm -hmm. uh, if you know. Doing. I think they had it in three or four parts, so it wasn't really hard. Stick had a pattern with the sticks on each other. I mm -hmm. uh, then pulled the flag up and then could raise it. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, both Cook and Peary said they left notes at the North Pole to prove they've been there, but nobody's ever found the note right. because again, they're the ice moves, so who knows who knows where they are. What did Cook die in prison? Uh, he was pardoned by President Roosevelt, so he got out of prison. Well, he actually got out of prison in 1930. They commuted his sentence, so he didn't be in prison anymore. Uh, and, and he was officially part of the 1940. Uh, so he only ended up spending uh, less than half the sentence, I think, at Fort Leavenworth. I'm not sure how he supported himself over the last decade. No. He was married again by now, but uh, I'm not sure what the fact he was doing. Uh, now, today, if you want to you know, make people unhappy with you, uh, all you need to do is find a place where a bunch of Cook supporters are meeting and say, you think Cook never got there. Right? Uh, he's got really strong partisans in favor of the idea that he did get to the North Pole. And what a lot of people mentioned is that Peary really did orchestrate a, a press campaign against him, uh, broadcasting all these claims about people who demonstrated that he, Cook probably didn't get to the top of Denali. Uh, and he had the National Geographic on his side as well. They were pretty powerful. And uh, Cook always viewed that as a smear campaign. He never thought he got a fair trial in public opinion. And a lot of people don't think he did to this day. So he still has supporters, as does Peary. And they can be very strident. So if you want a long, steady discussion, that's one way to do it. But you got to find somebody who's really into the issue first. But I would say that the uh, the morals go to Raul Hunt. That is our conclusion. Yes? Cook's boxes of records, were there ever any formal uh, searches? Yeah. Those? They looked around for him. Whitney never went back. Whitney was the one who put them under rocks, uh, supposedly by the cabin. But who knows what could have happened to them up there uh, in those conditions? So we don't know the precise spot 
so we've never been able to find them. Does Cook think he got there, and does Peary think he got there? I mean, without those records and without any authors. Well, yes. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to say uh, how much Cook really meant it when he said pretty with, with, with fair assurance that, that he had gotten there. Right. But we'll we'll never know. But he certainly wrote with great conviction. <laughs> yeah, like I, your joke. To, it seems to me that they both felt that they got there, but there's nothing Maybe. else that you know. But that could be. That's one. Peary went on to make a living out of it. You know. Cook, but yeah, between yeah. the two of them, if they thought they did. Yeah, so if, if Peary really did the, doctor his records, maybe he didn't. Right, exactly. But maybe he, he did that because he wanted to prove it, taking somewhere within that he did get there. Right. That's a, a, a mystery we'll never know. Right. <laughs> but we do know, we, we know for certain, for certain, for certain, we got to the cell phone first. Uh, so that, that's part of what we could cover next time. So we don't have to do that. We don't have to continue with polar exploration next year uh, if you don't want to, but that's at least one option. <laughs> We gotta finish it now. You gotta go to the summer. Yeah, I gotta go to the summer. Well, okay. yeah. finish. Oh, you don't right. have to wait till next year either. Just so yeah. I know you're always looking up. No, I mean you have to wait before next year. So yeah, that's right. what's happening next Sunday? Uh, no, nothing to talk about. Oh, I thought like like you were gonna. Uh, no, no, this is for uh, 2023. Yeah, next year. Yeah. Next year. Uh, and if any of you want to stick around, there's an art reception, right? Yes, at five o'clock. At five o'clock. Perfect. It's all for welcome. Thank well, you. Thank you. Well,